Hi, everyone, and welcome to this talk called uh, Really Crazy Container Troubleshooting Stories. My name is Gianluca. I'm a core developer of the open source system troubleshooting tool. And today I want to share with you a couple of uh, container troubleshooting stories that all happened to me over the past year or so. And they all revolve around uh, performance monitoring and stability of containers. Uh, as you'll see, I'm going to use uh, many observability tools for troubleshooting. So hopefully this will add some value to, you know, to your tool belt uh, of tools that you use daily. And uh, uh, these uh, stories might be a little bit controversial, uh, but I cherry pick them, uh, especially for this occasion, because uh, they will remind us that uh, user space and low level system components are very, very, very important, even if in the container ecosystem we keep building abstractions on top of what we already have. The first story I have is called Container Resolution Gone Wrong, and it's a story that is meant to show you a little bit what is the real cost and disadvantages of uh, lightweight virtualization, which is the one that is used by containers, obviously. And so I want to start, uh, I'll go rather quick over here because we lost already five minutes, but uh, I, I want to start with essentially the good parts of isolation. As you all know, if you run two containers, uh, by default, each container is wrapped into uh, its own PID uh, mount uh, network namespaces and things like that. So there's a pretty good level of isolation by default. And then you can also leverage you know, the various parameters of the C group. For example, if you use the CP accounting C group over here, uh, you can essentially specify the maximum amount of CPU that one container can consume, so that then if you run two, two containers that try to stress the CPU, one will not be able to use uh, more than 10% of the CPU, right? This is pretty simple. And at the same time, you can also do it from the memory point of view. So if you leverage the memory C group, you are able uh, to make a container not consume more than X amount of memory. And you can see over here in the chart that if I try to do uh, linear memory allocation inside the container, once it reaches the 512 megabyte, which is the same parameter that I use for the C group, uh, the, the process inside the container essentially gets killed. And this is all well. So this stuff is uh, widely supported by the kernel, is incredibly stable, and is really used as a basic building block for every container runtime. Although a while ago, something happened. Uh, we had essentially um, a customer, let's call it the way, a sysdig, who came to us and says, we uh, are using... We are using Kubernetes to orchestrate a heavily containerized application. And uh, we have different sort of containers all running inside the cluster. And when Kubernetes decide pseudo-randomly to allocate the same two containers on the same machine, so two different kind of containers on the same machine, the performance will suffer. So the performance of these two applications will uh, suffer. So we said, well, the first thing is, are you actually limiting the resources that this container can consume. And this customer said, yes, we are limiting them by limiting it using the CPU limits, memory limits, actually even block I.O. limits, I believe. So uh, this problem was, uh, at the beginning, quite interesting. And so we started to say, OK, what these two applications do? What are these two applications that are containerized do? And uh, uh, we started studying their behavior. And the two applications that I have are these ones. One is called Worker, and one is called Trasher. The Worker is essentially a simple watchdog application that doesn't do anything more than every few seconds scanning a directory for files and uh, uh, reacting if uh, the metadata of this file changes. So very simple. And it also reports uh, the duration of this uh, watchdog check as a statsy metric so that we can uh, inspect it and you know, centralize it and alert on it. And then I have another, another container, which is called uh, the Trasher application. And this one does a little bit of different things. But for the most part, it does some asynchronous processing of files. So very, very simple. And so again, the problem is, if these two containers get scheduled on the same host by Kubernetes, even if they are completely resource constrained, uh, the performance will suffer. So the first thing to do is, what do we mean when we say that the performance actually suffer? So to get a higher level understanding of the problem, we can just chart uh, the metric that the worker exports, which uh, essentially measures the duration of the, of, the, of the watchdog loop. And you can see it charted over here. And you can see how the pattern is uh, very, very predictable. The watchdog always takes 250 milliseconds to execute. Very, very, very predictable with extremely low variance. And this is when uh, the worker runs by itself on one host. When Kubernetes decides randomly to schedule 
the other container on the same host, I get this behavior. So the performance of the worker application linearly decreases up until they reach 600 milliseconds per loop. So this is more than 2x the performance overhead. And notice how the performance hit is exactly correlated with the life cycle of the uh, Thrasher container. Because these lines over here signals when the Thrasher container is started, and these lines over here signals when the Thrasher container is stopped. So you can see that the second I stop the other container, everything goes back to normal. I go back to the very predictable 250 milliseconds. So this was a quite interesting story, and uh, at this point, you know, I was trying to do a little bit more of troubleshooting. And what I like to do is, well, I, I like to get uh, a little bit of an X-ray of my applications running when I have to do some uh, uh, a little bit more advanced uh, troubleshooting. So I like to use uh, uh, the system call interface. And uh, this was, uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to go over this, but essentially this just shows that this container will actually consume very little resources from uh, CPU, memory, and I.O. point of view. I don't have, unfortunately, time to focus too much on this. So at the system call level, I am able to get a pretty good idea of what uh, uh, our process in Linux is doing, even without knowing how to read its source code, or even if I don't have its source code, right? And this is a quote that I really like from the S3 page that says that in some cases, the S3 output has proven to be more readable than the source. And uh, this resonates really, really well with my experience. Um, so I'm going to start by getting a system call analysis of my two applications. And uh, uh, I could use a trace for, for, for this troubleshooting. I'm actually going to use sysdig, because I'm a core developer of it, and it's a little bit more container friendly. But for the most part, any system call sniffer will do. So I'm going to start, in this case, by using my system call sniffer, specifying as a filter container name equal worker. And this is uh, a pretty good snippet of the activity of the container. So you can see, as I said, worker is a watchdog process that opens a bunch of directory. So you can see that the worker starts by opening a directory, in this case, slash Linux, slash dot git, so a git repository. And it gets back a file descriptor, which is essentially the file descriptor of the directory. And then it uses this file descriptor of the directory to another system call, the get the ends, so the get directory entries, that will return the list of children of this directory. So all the subfiles and subdirectory at the immediate next level. And for each element returned by the get directory entries, um, the, the worker process will use the LSTAT system call for each child to get metadata information from the inode. So it will get file type, file size, uh, uh, a bunch of timestamp, and things like that, that it will use for its processing. And in fact, you can see that uh, it does the LSTAT on head, and then it does the LSTAT on branches. When the worker recognizes that the actual uh, child, the actual directory entries, is a directory itself, it just recurs. In fact, you can see over here that then it uses immediately the open at slash Linux dot git branches. And this is just a typical, you know, uh, uh, full depth scan of a directory that you will do in any sort of programming language or scripting. And then when it finishes, it prints on screen the number of files processed, 61,000, and their total size. And again, it's not doing anything. It's just reading statistics via the LSTAT system call. And you can see by comparing latencies, which is something you can do quite well from the system call point of view, that there's 250 milliseconds of difference between these two numbers, which exactly matches you know, the watchdog loop duration. What about the Thrasher container? The Thrasher container does a, a little bit of a similar activity, except that it opens a bunch of random files. Look at over here. All the files that is open are slash TMP, slash this random UUID. And it does this a few times per second. Although, uh, if you can see over here, none of these open at actually succeed. All these open at will return an error in or end, you know, which is the kernel that says this file doesn't exist. And it does this for, again, a few times per second. Then you can see that there is uh, actually a context switch, a process context switch. And uh, the process then sleeps for about a second and a half, if you compare the two timestamps. And then it tries again with a new set of random files. Again, this logic is a little bit stupid. The original application was doing something more interesting. Uh, but for the purpose of this, it's, it's, it's fine. This, this behavior is enough to actually reproduce the, the, whole, uh, the whole performance issue. So now that I have the system call analysis, what I can do is uh, I can start to dig more into the question, what part of my process is slowing down when these two containers are scheduled, right? It could be either user space, in which case I don't see any, uh, uh, any, 
any essentially system call latency increase, or it could be from the system level, so from the kernel level. And so if I take uh, a view of my system call analysis before the performance issue and during the performance issue, and I compare all these numbers, then I am able to essentially see if this latency is, is centered around a specific set of system calls. So I could do this by hand. Uh, one of the reasons why I use sysdig is because I can script this analysis actually with simple Lua scripts. And so I'm exactly going to do that. And here I have uh, the result of two scripts running that will output me on screen uh, where the delay is spent when the thrasher is not there and when the thrasher is there. Now, if you compare these two, you can see that all these numbers look all quite similar, except, oops, except the LSTAT system call. You can see how the LSTAT system call, when the performance issue is there, takes three seconds more to execute. And uh, if I compare these three seconds more to the actual duration of the system call uh, uh, analysis that I did, I get exactly those 300 milliseconds overhead that were over there in the chart. So clearly, uh, the worker process is slowing down because the LSTAT system call itself is much slower. So this was interesting. Um, there is already, there's also one more thing that I can uh, essentially troubleshoot, which is, is this additional three seconds delay caused by one specific uh, directory access? For example, is this focused on one specific LSTAT invocation, or is it evenly spread across all the 61,000 LSTAT system calls that uh, the worker process does? And uh, to do this, I'm going to use another essentially um, tool in the troubleshooting world, which is essentially the spectrogram. So if I take all these latencies and I chart them by frequency, I can get to something like this, where I can see the frequency of my system calls bucketed by their delay. So each row in this chart is one second of activity of my process wor of my watchdog worker. So you can see it's pretty impulsive, right? It's, uh, you know, it does something, then it goes to sleep for a few seconds. And uh, the red bands show us where the latency is focused at. So you can see that the whole, during the whole duration, the vast majority of the LSAT system calls were under one microsecond. What if I compare this with the second case, when the performance issues are there? I get a very similar view, although notice how this time all the, the, vast, well, all the LSAT system calls are much more skewed towards the 10 microseconds. So look at here the difference, one microsecond, 10 microseconds. Almost. So we have almost a 10x overhead evenly spread across all the LSTAT system calls. Very good. Um, at this point, I kind of exhausted what, I can, uh, what information I can gather from a system call analysis. Because again, the next question is, why are the LSTAT system calls low, right? Which part of the LSTAT system call is causing, is causing this issue? So I'm going uh, to switch, I'm going to switch troubleshooting tool. And this time, I'm going to get into perf. Uh, I'm sure most of you know Perf, but Perf is essentially the official uh, kernel observability tool uh, shipped with the Linux kernel itself, and it's by far the tool with the highest number of errors into each kernel subsystem, uh, because you can do a lot of very cool things. You can do performance counter, dynamic tracing, uh, dynamic probing, uh, almost essentially live debugging. You can do CPU profiling. So in this instance, I'm going to use Perf for doing actual CPU profiling. So I'm going to profile the activity of the worker process while the overhead is happening. And this will show me all the functions executed in the kernel space on behalf of my process. And so this is how I invoke it. I invoke it with perf top, uh, bypassing it the PID of the process in, you know, in the global PID namespace. And this will show me all the functions. And you can see the overwhelmingly majority of the kernel time on behalf of the worker process is spent on the, the, on the DLOOKUP function. So the LSAT system call is calling this DLOOKUP function. Now, what the hell is the DLOOKUP function? Um, I can use perf once again. If you give perf enough debugging symbol, it will give you a lot of information. So if you use actually perf probe on the DLOOKUP symbol, it will actually print you uh, the kernel function. And this kernel function is quite simple, uh, but I want to go over with you. Um, what it does. So the, LS, uh, the LSTAT system call, every time you need to open a path, it calls the LSTAT system call. What happens in Linux is that if you, if you, if you have a generic path like slash TMP slash foo, there's a bunch of crap that the kernel needs to do in order to ensure that this path is valid. So it needs to start, you know, by the slash inode, navigate the inode on disk, 
and reach the directory entries which are pointed by the inode and match each one until one named TMP is found. Then from the TMP, repeat it again with the TMP inode and go until you find uh, one that is named foo. This is a lot you know, of disk accesses and stuff like that. So it makes a lot of sense to cache this information. And in fact, the DLOOKUP function is exactly a function that taken the directory entry of a parent and taken a string name of a child, it will look up in the directory entry cache if this path has already been before. And uh, the, uh, the directory entry cache itself is implemented just as a very big hash table, so classic hash table, you know, with an array, uh, essentially bucketizing items, and then a list of all the directory entries hash into the same value. So why, why the worker process is slow during actually a cache lookup? Could it be that since this is a hash table, uh, this hash table is growing a lot and uh, it's causing some sort of issues. So it, for example, increases the number you know, of hash table collisions and this causes a performance as seen in user space. I can verify this with another troubleshooting tool and I can use Slaptop. Slaptop is a very simple tool that prints me the size of the kernel caches. So all the object pools are located in the kernel caches. And you can see that when the thrasher is running, the D entry cache, the directory entry cache, is 20 gigabytes in size with 102, million, uh, with 102 million directory entries, which is far bigger than the, all the files that I actually have on disk, you know, on this file system. I have, I, I've never operated on a system with 100 million files. And if I use it without thrasher, instead, when the performance issue is not there, when the other container is not there, the D entry cache is just 14 megabytes. So, these 20 gigabytes are the ones that are causing the hash table average lookup because of collisions to become slower. So how the hell is it possible that, uh, uh, you know, my pressure container is affecting so much this hash table? And the reason is uh, over here. In this, first, uh, in, in this first analysis, you can see that uh, the pressure process tries to open a bunch of files that don't exist. But since the kernel is very smart, it does some sort of negative caching. So even if a file doesn't exist, it saves into its the entry cache the information that it didn't exist. So that next time I ask for it, it will say, no, I don't have it without doing any sort of these accesses. Unfortunately, in this case, since uh, the de entry cache is a singleton, because it's not virtualized, since it's a singleton, the thrasher process is able to pollute it. And as a byproduct of this, the worker, the worker container suffers because the worker container needs to access the entry cache and so it will cause a bunch of, uh, a bunch of issues. So two very important things. Uh, using all this memory for the entry cache is very good because this is idle memory. This is memory that has not been reclaimed by any user space process. So the kernel is putting, is putting it to good use. And issue number two, this is not an IO contention issue because these processes are just doing a few kilobytes of IO per second. You know, trying to read some IO doesn't really cost anything. So um, this is a data structure contention caused by the fact that the D entry cache is a singleton between uh, uh, all the containers in my system. Now, to go to the conclusion, the conclusion is a little bit uh, controversial, but it turns out that this customer uh, was using a distribution based on EL6, so a very old kernel with containers, which again, uh, the people in this audience will laugh about it, but I mean, this really happened, so that's why I brought this story, because this really happened, and it was like a very big customer or something like that. And it turns out that, uh, of course, the EL6 kernel well, is not the best target platform for containers. And in fact, uh, even if a process is limited in a memory group in a container, in an, on an EL6 kernel, on a 2.6.32, it can still cause enough kernel allocations on kernel caches that uh, far exceed uh, the actual limit of the memory C group set. This behavior was fixed a while ago. So if you use a modern kernel, this doesn't happen. The treasure container, if it was memory limited, wouldn't have been able to allocate 20 gigabyte of the entry cache objects. But this still proves a point. You know, the point that I was, uh, the, that I was gonna make is that um, on a recent kernel, this issue will not happen. But since not every resource is virtualized, there will always be Maybe a global persubsystem kernel lock or a, or a singleton data structure 
that, that could cause actual contentions between containers. And it has to be, because if every single resource was uh, actually isolated, we wouldn't have lightweight virtualization, and we would have another KVM, right, for containers. Uh, so the gist of it is that you should probably uh, and properly observe your application so that you know what performance you want to expect and things like that. Because Kubernetes is never going to be able, you know, to in a scheduling decision to determine, oh, there's this one has too much uh, memory allocated in a kernel cache, so I'm going to be much smarter in my scheduling decision. So this is something that, as an operator, you have to handle. This was the first story. Uh, the second one is a little bit shorter, and I'm going to cut it quite heavily because uh, time is running out. Uh, and it's called In Search of FF, FF, FF 600, 400. This, is a, this, is a, this, was, a, this was a typical Heisenberg. Uh, that uh, happened to me, so I think that I could never, never, ever, ever replicate. And so it started by us shipping an application to a customer in containers. This application was composed of several containers. We had a Java application, then we have a couple of databases, like we had MySQL and Redis. And this customer said, okay, I deployed this application on Kubernetes, but your containers are not starting. And he, he sent me this chart of uh, uh, essentially the metric Kubernetes pod restart count showing me that the Redis container was constantly restarting. You can see the Kubernetes is restarting with an exponential back-off delay, which means that the container wasn't starting itself. And there were two interesting things in this problem. The first one is that there were no logs at all from Docker, from Kubernetes, from Redis itself. And the second one is that among all the containers that could have failed, the one that failed was Redis, which we used it very little for our application, so we didn't customize it, so we took an off-the-shelf Redis image straight from the Docker Hub, and as you can imagine, this ran very, very well on my machine, right? There's, yeah. So, again, system call-based analysis, and this is a system call-based analysis of the container that is uh, not starting. You can see that it starts with an exec v system call, which is just a system call that you use to, you know, execute a new program in Linux. And the executable is bash as an argument entry point of SH. So this is just the standard container entry point that runs in pretty much every container and sets up a bunch of crap like uh, environment variables and things like that. Although five seconds, the exec v over here from 133 to 138, you can see that the process exited with status 11. So status 11 means that the process crashed, right? In fact, right before, you can see that a signal was delivered from the kernel to the bash process of type signal segmentation fault. So the bash process did a, I don't know, a weird memory access that, call, that uh, caused it to crash. And right before the signal deliver, you can see a page fault event. So there was indeed an invalid memory access. A page fault event on this address, FFFF 600 400. So bash tried to access this weird memory address. And what was even weird is that, look at here, the instruction pointer itself was FFFF 600 400. So not only the memory access was done by bash, but was done as part of an instruction fetch. So the bash process was trying to execute a function at this weird memory address, which is at the very far end of the 64-bit address space. And again, I'm not super advanced in that area, so I was very surprised at the beginning, because again, bash is supposed to be a very um, stable process, right? Uh, I mean, I've never seen it crash usually, so I was very surprised. OK. so. Uh, System call analysis done. So at this point, I need to go you know, to standard uh, developer. Let's call it troubleshooting. So we asked the customer for a core dump of this. And I opened it with GDB. Uh, and with GDB, I just used you know, the standard BT to show me the stack trace of the bash process. Because again, it's not ready. It's the bash process at the time of the crash. And you can see that indeed, uh, you know, the, 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 the lowest stack frame uh, it's FFFF is under 400. So indeed, Bash was trying to call a function at that uh, memory address. But if you, if you walk up the stack, you can see that time was in the stack trace. And time is a very simple system call that shouldn't do anything other than you know, return the current timestamp. So why exactly Bash decided to call um, this other weird address instead of just natively sending a system call invocation? And uh, uh, GDB is kind enough to point me to the actual um, source code where this time invocation is done, right from the libc. So I decided to, uh, obviously, go and open uh, the can of worms and go look at the time.s file inside the libc source code at that version. And this is a bunch of assembly that shows you how the vc is called, time is called. 
But what was interesting is that the actual address, FFFX 600 400, is actually defined at the very top of the file with this name, this is called other v time. So this was enough to give me enough material to go on Google, you know, and research what the hell a VCS call is. And it turns out that the VCS call is an optimization relic from the past. So as you know, whenever you have to invoke a system call, there's, um, there's a protocol, right? So you have to write all the, all the arguments in, you know, in the CPU registers, and then you have to send uh, a, special, a special instruction to the CPU so that it switches to kernel mode and the system call is executed on the process behalf. Turns out that this is much, much slower, right, than a, than, a native system, than a native function invocation where you just have to advance the instruction pointer and fix the stack. So the kernel developer said, okay, there are a few system calls that are very, very simple, like time, get time of the day, get CPU, and something like that. And it's quite a waste to have uh, them uh, switch to kernel mode just to execute very little and then return. And so the kernel developers, a long time ago, implemented this VCS call mechanism where they said, OK, we are going to map into every process in Linux, we are going to map the native code for a few system call invocation so that if user space wants, user space can just uh, uh, execute them straight from this address natively without switching to the kernel. And the time system call was indeed hard coded, hard -coded at this address. And, uh, and then, of course, you know, the libc adapted. That's why in the libc code you can see this thing. But over time, it turns out that this VCS call mechanism is quite, uh, you know, it's not very secure because mapping native instructions to a, predictable ad uh, to a predictable location in every single address space is, is, is not the most secure thing. And so kernel developers said, okay, let's crash that and let's actually re-implement this at the VDSO, which is the current state of the art. And for the purpose of the discussion, the VDSO is exactly like the VCS call, except that the native code is not mapped uh, at a fixed location in the other space, but is randomly mapped, you know, as, as you would normally do, you know, with a memory mapped file or things like that. So the, and then of course, the libc adapted and said, okay, now we are gonna start using the libc, uh, sorry, the VDSO. And it turns out that over time, VCS call was more and more and more deprecated to the point where if you use a modern kernel, the VCS call doesn't really work well and you enter in one of these two cases. If you try to execute from most Linux distribution nowadays from the VCS call page, you can still execute it, but uh, you will get trapped into the kernel and the VCS call will get emulated for you. So there's really not like uh, native machine code. Or if you use most secure distributions, the VCS call is actually disabled and if you try to execute from the VCS call page, your process will be terminated. And this is not a problem, right? Because if you use a modern distribution, whoever packaged the distribution for you obviously took care of shipping a modern libc, right? But you can already see how this is going. Since I'm using containers and the libc is not a, is not a dependency of the Linux distribution, but of the base container image, it turns out that this customer was using a very modern uh, Debian kernel that enabled the VCS call non around last year, around exactly one year ago. And they were kind enough to say, this breaks glibc 2.13 and earlier, which is fine, because again, if you use you know, this modern Debian kernel, you're gonna use this modern libc that comes with Debian. And can you imagine what uh, libc version was in my Redis container? 2.13. And this is an image straight from the Docker app. This is just a, a little bit, oh, a bit older version of Redis, but you know, quite stable and you know, battle ready. So just because I was using the Redis container uh, based on an old base image, I got screwed. And of course, in my system, it was working because my system, which is running uh, a slightly older Debian, was uh, still using the emulated VCS call mode. Now, even if I didn't experience the crash, remember though that the emulated VCS call mode, as I was saying, is an emulation. So I then did a little, a little benchmark, and look at this. If I'm using the time system call from a libc version that uses the VDSO, I can do 260 million events per second, super fast. This is native function call invocation, incredibly fast. Whereas if I use the VCS call emulated mode, which again, causes a trap into the kernel, something like that, I can just do one million events per second. So there's a massive difference in throughput. Of course, with Redis, uh, I'm not going to suffer this much overhead, right? Because it's not that my Redis process is just <laughs> spinning in a loop doing, doing time. 
but you can get the idea. And again, the idea for this is that I want to just, which might be completely obvious you know, to this audience because it's a very advanced technical audience, but uh, user space really needs to be taken care of and needs to be loved uh, uh, on your base distribution as well as uh, on your base images. So even if you download a, a Docker image straight from the Docker Hub, take care you know, to just inspect the Docker file and if you see you know, that it's based on Debian Wheezy, say, whoa, okay, maybe, maybe I need to change it. Um, and, this is, and that's what happened. And again, this is an issue that uh, really, really happened to me. Uh, and this is all I had. If you later uh, take a look at the slides, I have a little bit of additional more content when I actually use perf in the first, in the first exercise to actually measure how many hash collisions were per, per individual DLOOKUP invocation, as well as I did uh, a few experiments uh, uh, when I was actually looking at how the emulated system call mode works and things like that. So uh, this was quite useful from the point of view, uh, you know, of understanding the system, especially because I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in those areas. And uh, I think we are a couple minutes earlier, so if there's a couple questions, I'll be happy to take them. Otherwise, thank you very much. There's a question somewhere. I cannot, where is it? Oh, no, no. There's a question there. I did not hear anything, unfortunately. How? Which one? Which one how did I fix? This one? This last one? Uh, well, we just uh, uh, essentially recreated the Docker image of the Redis container with a, with a much newer base image. I think we went with Alpine and everything was working fine. Because it was a mistake on our site you know, to, the, to begin with, because we saw this on the Docker Hub, we said, you know, it must be good, because it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's the official one, it was not one that you just do with, uh, you know, well, uh, you know, it's, uh, you live and learn, so that's, that's definitely something we learned. <laughs> Another question, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You added one slide about the performance uh, of the VDSO against the native. Yeah. Uh, do, do you have an idea why uh, there is such a big difference between the two? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you mean this one, right? Between the first and the second column. You're saying uh, why the native one is not doing 266 million. Yeah, exactly. That's because the native one is not implemented with native machine instruction itself. But if you look at here, the native one, if you go actually with GDB, and you and you print the content, you know, with this as you print the content of the of the business call page, you can see that this actually is just a standard system call invocation. There's a move, you know, of the system call number into oops, into the uh, into the AX register, and then there's a system call invocation. Whereas the VDSO, it's really native code right there. So this still causes a trap into the kernel. It's faster than the other one that is emulated because the other one uses an emulation via page fault, and then the page fault itself has a big switch in the kernel that emulates this, uh, but this is the reason. Cool. Thank you very much again.